And with us today is Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on GoldenJackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure being on, Elijah. All right. Well, I asked viewers to submit questions, and these first few questions have to do with the stability of the financial system. This viewer wants to know about derivatives and the domino effect they might have and how they might trigger a collapse. They ask, we often hear of bubbles in stocks, government bonds, municipal bonds, corporate bonds, U.S. mortgages, U.S. consumer debt, U.S. student loans, and U.S. car loans. I assume derivatives are an extra layer of financial instruments that are on top of all of these former mentioned types of debt, as they all derive from other types of debt or even derive from other derivatives. Can you please give an example how some of these derivatives work and explain how a black swan event could make derivatives kind of create a domino effect? We could ha see a domino effect in the derivatives market where one derivative makes another derivative fall down because they are so strongly interrelated with each other. Okay. <clears throat> I understand the question. Um, this gets very thorny and, and extends like with tentacles. Uh, the person's asking the, this question or this type of question, they, they, need to, they need to recall something very important, that among the major derivative contracts, one stands out as being somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of all the action, and that is the interest rate swap derivative. The interest rate swap derivative is a complex contract that, that plays an arbitrage game of the, the cash versus the coupon and the long term versus the short term bond. And it requires for its high volume uh, power, it requires the zero percent on the short end. So we're, we're starting to put some strain. This was not part of the question, but it's going to be part of the answer. We're putting some strain on this important derivative called the interest rate swap contract by increasing the interest rate on the short end because it works better when you have free money. It's like on the industrial input. What's the input? You know, it, it, in industrial input, it might be just the copper price coming into the foundry. Uh, along with, say, the coal price in the foundry for the heat source. Okay, so copper and coal are the input. In, in the interest rate uh, derivative, interest rate swap, it's the cost of short-term money. Okay, so we're still very, very cheap, and it's close enough to zero where they can probably do some little internal arbitrages and make their money source still virtually free. Okay. Why do I mention the interest rate swap? First of all, it's 80 to 90 percent of the action. But second of all, it provides the U.S. government with a financing source for its 1.2, 1.4 trillion dollars of deficit every year. And if you believe that the deficit is only 500 to 600 billion a year, you got rocks in your head because they're doing little one-off adjustments all over the place within the, the fiscal year. And this is not seasonal adjustment. It's just little line items. I mean, you, they might as well just put in, well, we have $150 billion of narcotics money. We can offset with that. So the debt is debt lower by that amount. And, and lots of little things like that. Uh, it's, a, it's not a great example, but you get the idea that, that we're doing uh, one-off adjustments all over the place. And there's no seasonal adjustment for an annual report. You don't say, well, you know, July was low and April was high for tax season, uh, and therefore we got some adjustment. No, no, it's one full year. Get out of the way. Okay, so you have d derivatives. Now, as for ripple, ripple effect, contagion effects, I think we're going to see some impact from a certain activity that's going on that is altering these interest rate swap contracts that provide the artificial demand. It's where the great majority of the Treasury bond buying is taking place. It's being done by the Department of Treasury. 
in their exchange stabilization fund. The strain on this system is from the dumping by foreign governments and central banks of their treasury bonds in their forex reserves. Now, they've got something they call the LTM, the last 12 months. So think of it as a rolling sum of 12 months of bond dumping. Every month, you knock off the, the earliest month, you add on the new month, and you get 12 months, you add them up together, and you get a figure. Well, the last 12 months is getting worse every month for dumping treasury bonds. What does that mean? It means that more strain is being put on the interest rate swap derivative, which provides the artificial demand for treasury bonds, which finance the U.S. government debt in a climate when foreigners are not buying. There are almost no bond buyers for the treasury, U.S. treasury bonds. Then why are interest rates near 2 percent? Why aren't they near 10 percent? You got a trillion dollar annual deficit. It needs to be financed, and there are no buyers. Why are we not just as bad as Greece and Italy before the Euro Central Bank stepped in? The answer is simple interest rate swap derivatives. Now, here's an example of how important they are. In the second half of 2010, Morgan Stanley added $9 trillion worth of interest rate swap derivatives to their books. It showed up in the OCC, Office of Comptroller of the Currency. And the press did not follow this story. They instead said that there was a global treasury bond bond rally. It was a big-ass lie. It was a big Wall Street derivative rally and initiative. Okay, this happened in, in 2010 and 11 at a time when the treasury bonds were drying up in demand from foreign central banks. In came the, I think it was, to be more exact, I think it was eight and a half trillion dollars worth of Morgan Stanley uh, interest rate derivatives uh, in the OCC. It's, it's all there. You just have to pull it out and read it. But that's not what the Wall Street Journal and New York Times do. They don't report these things. They're part of the problem. Okay, this huge dumping by foreign central banks is putting more stress on the Treasury's interest rate swap derivative complex machinery at a time when foreigners are accelerating their dumping and at the same time the Fed is ratcheting up little by little quarter percent interest rate hike. So there is your point of stress. Interest rate swap derivatives. Now, could we see an accident? Yeah, we could. We could. Um, but I think more likely is we're going to see an amplification of the Fed, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and the Department of Treasury all working together, an acceleration of their derivative activity. When word gets out, that the machinery is under great strain and the volume is getting somewhat out of control. The story of the derivative machinery under strain, I think, is going to cause an acceleration of foreign treasury bond dumping. And that could produce a vicious cycle of more strain more bad rumors, more dumping, more strain, more volume, more rumors, more dumping. And this could be how the Treasury bond gets isolated and the dollar becomes a victim of its own false machinery operating to produce false demand. And it, the result could be something as simple as foreign countries saying, well, we better play it safe and not use the Treasury bill in trade payment, like with oil, like with container vessels, like with big international contracts. That's how I think the ripple effect could hit. And if, if you do see something happen with Treasury bonds, you might, you might actually 
see something very unusual happen where the rates, the bond yields, either go up a lot or down a lot. I don't know which direction, but they're going to get unstable. And, and that's when you're going to see gold mentioned as a, a solution. Let's, let's move toward... Uh, let's move away from the Treasury bill and trade payment. Let's move to something more stable, like like Chinese RMB in Asia, uh, like the gold trade note, which is piece by piece coming together. I hope that answers your question. Now, this viewer's question uh, is about the gold trade note that China might move to. So they're wondering, how can China move to a gold trade note, then eventually a coveted gold currency without hurting their exports? That's, that's a tough question. Um, let's first get to the, the dynamics and mechanics of gold trade note. Something has happened in the last year or more that I think is uh, the components, the pieces coming together for the gold trade note. Let me back up with something, though. In uh, somewhere around 2012, 13, the U.S. government, like absolute fools under Obama, uh, put in the Iran sanctions. And not only were the sanctions a bad idea, but they they actually put them in in like an amateurish, stupid fashion by saying that the Iran Central Bank could not be involved in in the payments. Uh, so the Iranians arranged for all their large banks to be involved in the payments. And then interior to Iran, they had the different swap arrangements between the big banks and the central banks. So the workaround was like a Boy Scout simple experiment. Obama's henchmen running Treasury were just total idiot rookies. What Iran did was to sell India oil and take payment in Turkish gold. It's called the, the Iran uh, Oil for Gold Triangle. The Turks were paid by India and provided the gold to the big Iranian banks who made the swaps with the Iran Central Bank. Okay, <clears throat> but that exposed how oil could be sold for gold payment with an intermediary like Turkey. Okay, now step forward. The reaction, and this came as a correct forecast for me in 2014, this is like a knee-jerk forecast that came out. The Iran, I'm sorry, the Ukraine war took place, and uh, I came out with a statement that uh, Russia and China would begin dealing exclusively in the dollar, and it would start in the energy trade, and it, and it happened rather quickly. What happened was uh, the Chinese and Russians made a deal for the for construction of pipelines oil pipelines. And China said that they will pay for the construction with treasury bonds, which is a huge insult uh, to the U.S. government. But China would then later pay for the oil uh, in RMB, their own currency, Chinese yuan. RMB stands for renminbi. It's synonymous. Well, you know, for us Americans and us Westerners, RMB is pretty much synonymous with yuan, but it's not. And I don't want to get into the distinctions. It, the, the, the distinction involves Chinese currency held outside of China. Uh, but let's not get into that. Anyway, the Chinese made a deal to pay for the construction of the pipeline with treasury bond, but to pay for the oil that flowed in it with RMB to Russia. <clears throat> the Russians have been receiving RMB payments now for close to a year for Russian-produced oil. And they're taking the RMB, going straight to the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and using the RMB-denominated gold futures contract in Shanghai to buy gold. So the Chinese are buying oil from Russia, paying in RMB, and the Russians are converting it to gold. Now the Chinese are coming out, and this is in progress now, if not already, or next couple of weeks, the Chinese are coming up with an RMB futures contract for oil. It's not because the Chinese produce oil and they'll deliver on the contracts. It's to facilitate the RMB usage in oil payments. 
Watch the Saudis cooperate with this, and this will be the instrument by which the Saudis sell China oil and take payment in RMB. The hedging will be done in Shanghai with RMB. Sorry, I live near a boulevard. The, China, the Chinese will take the oil and make payments in RMB, which will be hedged in Shanghai with futures contracts denominated in RMB. Okay, very interesting development. Okay, so this is going to take form piece by piece. Um, the Russian-Chinese relationship with respect to oil and RMB payments that are connected to, to gold, I think will provide the final death blow to the U.S. dollar and its petrodollar status. Now, just imagine, China is the world's number one importer of oil. Russia is the world's number one producer of oil. They're not using the dollar. They're eventually, and it's already happening, they're, they're, move, they're taking steps toward converting the oil payments into gold for final delivery on those payments. Where's the petrodollar standard? All you need to, to bring a final coffin with lots of nails in it is for the Saudis to sell China oil in RMB terms. And once that happens, you're going to see the other Gulf Emirates follow suit, and then you're going to see Nigeria, and you're going to see Mexico with all their Asian, not just China, but Asian oil sales. Imagine South Korea buying oil not just from Iran, but from the Gulf Emirates and not using the dollar for any of it. Imagine Japan doing the same thing. So if Korea, that's a big triangle for me, Korea, Japan, and, and China all buying Middle East oil and not paying in dollars. That's the end of the petrodollar. So th this is a very big risk. And, and uh, if you could remind me, uh, Eli, what was the second part of that question? Because I, I didn't jot a note down. How will turning to a gold currency, how, how will that impact China's exports? How will they do that without hurting their exports? Very delicate and, and good question, because if you really want to kill your export trade, come up with a real good, viable, strong currency that is not a standard across the world. That sounds ironic, but imagine that, that the Chinese do not have much support and they come up with a, a, a big, powerful, say, uh, gold, partly gold back RMB currency. Well, then the, the RMB would rise and rise relative to the other global currencies, and that would put a slamming brakes uh, on the Chinese export trade. So that's why the Chinese are not going to do that. What the Chinese instead are going to try to do, and this has been a very important point of mine in the hat trick letter for the last few years, what, what they're trying, what they're going to try to do is get a critical mass of support so that, say, the entire Eurasian trade zone follows suit and you don't get 5 and 10 or 15 percent support for a, a new, viable, stronger currency, but instead you get a, a 55, 60, 65 percent support, which turns out to be critical mass. So the Chinese can protect their export trade primarily by getting other nations on board in Southeast Asia, along with, say, Kazakhstan and the other former Soviet republics, plus Russia, plus, say, Bulgaria, and maybe Hungary, and other nations like maybe Turkey. There's some big news out there this past week regarding Turkey, where they're, they're going to, uh, it seems like they nationalized their, their gold industry. By that, I mean mining and, and marketing. Um, and it looks like the vast Turkish gold sector might be serving soon as the intermediary for gold payments in trade 
across the Eurasian trade zone. So this is probably going to be coordinated with respect to China. Very interesting, but the Chinese must acquire a critical mass for whatever better currency they want to use so that when it's introduced, it's not the minority, but rather the, the critical mass majority. And then the problem comes for the other countries that are dollar centric because they're in the minority. And that's when they start to see currency crisis. So if the Chinese can get this critical mass majority, what they do is they put the dollar on the defensive so that the dollar with their Canadian, British, and Western European support, Australia too, they're in the minority. And suddenly they're having price problems from a currency crisis. This is how China must have it done. But they, they know what they're doing. They know very well what they're doing. All right, now moving on here. This next question is about how the U.S. and also Japan are in uh, a lot of debt right now. This viewer wants to know, the U.S. and Japan both have a debt-based fiat monetary system. Do you believe that in order to keep their monetary systems alive, they will need to create more and more loans to keep the currency level stable, and that both the U.S. and Japanese governments have become the Fed's and the Bank of Japan's lender of last resort, thus explaining one of the major reasons why these two countries are on the edge of bankruptcy? Or for the U.S., has the Fed been giving loans out to both the U.S. government and the big banks under the table, never to be paid back at 0% interest rates so they don't have to face implosion that you normally would see in a debt-based monetary system? So that was kind of a long question but there. <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah, I got it. And uh, it's really, really complicated. Um, let's back up. 1981. The U.S. and Wall Street banks made a very slick maneuver. They pretty much ordered, I know this doesn't sound right, but they ordered the Japanese Central Bank to go to 0% and to start this disastrous experiment of quantitative easing. Now, the Japanese went toward 0% and amplified their bond purchases in 1981. Here we are, 36 years later. I ask you, Elijah, have they moved away from 0% and have they moved away from amplified bond purchases? No, not really. I mean, obviously, the, the Fed raised interest rates a little bit, but it's very close to 0% still. So, Yes. The answer is hell no. It's not even an, an, an equivocal no. So what they've done is they've wrecked their system by taking orders – from the U.S. Central Bank, and not just Central Bank, but Wall Street banks, okay? And by doing so, they've put themselves in a trap. Uh, the Japanese are in a trap, and they cannot get out of it. I said back in 2009, early, right after Lehman, we're going down to 0%. And when we got there, I said, we're going to stay there forever, and, of course, I got a lot of critical emails saying, Jim, what a stupid thing to say. No one goes down to zero percent forever. And I said, well, apparently you haven't paid attention to Japan because they've been there. Here we are, 2009. They've been there for 28 years. Did you not notice? It's a, it's a blind alley with no exit. That's the way it works. Uh, there, there's no way out. So... There's an important aspect to this. Um, what it does for Wall Street and what it did in 1991 was it provided Wall Street immediately an opportunity. I know this is a roundabout answer, but, you know, this is very important for understanding Japan. And, you, and to understand Japan now, you must understand Japan in 1991. But what Wall Street did was they set up the yen carry trade where they would borrow free money, 0% money in Japan, and they would come out and buy U.S. stocks on the other side. What they did was they made a trillion dollar annual profit engine that was free. It's free. I mean, can you imagine 
Would you like a method where you could make a trillion dollars a year using free money? <clears throat> so that's the reality. That's the background for this. The Japanese are essentially U.S. slaves when it comes to banking, when it comes to military. Notice that on the military side, I won't get into a long military diatribe, but Japan has been for forbidden for 60-some years from having a military. We're giving them orders for banking and for a lot of things. Uh, not, not completely for trade policy, but we do throw our weight around a lot. Okay, so this is this is very important. Something very important happened about a year ago, you know, maybe 10 months ago, so somewhere around 10, 12 months ago. The Japanese started amplifying. Oh, actually, I, I think I got that wrong. Uh, maybe it was around two years ago. The Japanese Japanese made an announcement. I'm not I'm not crazy here. I follow the historical facts. The Japanese made a statement. I think it was late 2015. I can't get this exactly right. They made a statement and said that they were going to make their QE, their, their monetization expansion, their money supply growth for the purpose of buying bonds, sovereign bonds. They actually said at the Bank of Japan, we're going to expand QE to infinite volume. They actually said that. And I came out immediately and said, look for the Japanese yen to go down 20%. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. And, and it did it in short order, like three or four months. Okay. So you have to look at Japan's buying. What did they do then? They went out and bought a lot of treasury bonds. And they stuck out like a sore thumb because all the other major uh, – export surplus nations were selling. They weren't buying, which begged the question of what were they buying with all their exports, export surplus? The answer is gold reserves in secrecy. The answer is uh, regional sovereign bonds. The answer was Chinese government bonds. <sighs> Very messy. So the U.S. gave orders that they were going to steal the Japanese government pension fund worth a trillion dollars. I'm not making this up, people. It's all there. Two or three years ago, the U.S. government confiscated the Japanese government pension fund worth 1.1 or 1.2 trillion dollars and used it to purchase treasury bonds and force Japan to go into QE with infinite volume to replace their forex reserve bonds in their holdings. And that bought the dollar some more time. This is what we do in Washington and New York. We steal trillions to continue our fraudulent dollar system. Okay, <clears throat> the Japanese Think of their motive, just, you know, on their own, their own motive. They're thinking, well, you know, we need to be very careful here. We need to preserve our export trade. So they do so by lowering their Japanese yen currency. In other words, they cooperate with the United States they have no choice but to, to, to say goodbye to a trillion dollars in their pension fund, and they're given an opportunity to replace it with free money, with the blessings of the U.S. government. As far as U.S. and Japanese are concerned, neither side's a bigger loser. I'm not calling him a win-win. Notice that. I said neither side is a big loser. Okay. Well, it's really not so simple because... What they've done is they've, they've really given themselves a death sentence. The Japanese and the U.S. are like two players fighting in the 
in a very deep swimming pool with chains around both their necks. They're fighting, but they're tied together. Okay, this is not going to end well, and I, I can honestly say I do not know how it's going to end. But I think what we're going to see eventually is the Japanese realizing that this is Harry Carey with chains and the Americans in the swimming pool. This is Harry Carey. This is suicide. This is not going to go in anywhere positively. And I think that what's going to happen is the, China, uh, the Japanese are going to say, we don't like China. We've never liked China. We have a thousand years of bitter national uh, strife and conflict between our two countries. We have genocide chapters going back 300 years, 200 years, 100 years. We have a lot of bad blood, but we're both Asians and we don't like the Americans and we both need to get away from the dollar. So Japan is going to embrace the Russian and Chinese initiatives toward a legitimate currency system. And, you know, the real historians would say, but Jim, isn't that what Japan did in the early months of 2011? And the answer is, hell yes. All right, now moving on here. This viewer wants to know how they can take action. What can we do as individuals to combat the global banking cabal? <laughs> what can we do to combat the, the global banking cabal? Sell all of your stocks and bonds and paper assets and buy gold and silver bars and coins. Do not buy the exchange traded funds like GLD and SLV. Uh, buy the Sprott Physical Gold Fund called PHYS. Buy the Sprott Silver Physical Fund called PSLV. But definitely stay away from the Wall Street funds. You need to get out of paper assets and get into metal assets. And it makes full sense to do so because they're propping up the stocks and propping up the bonds and they're suppressing the gold and silver. So sell what they're propping up and buy what they're suppressing. This is an, an old saying for investors, buy low, sell high. That's been to turned totally upside down in the last 10 to 20 years. Most people buy what's going up and is way high in price because they're dumb. If you want to be smart, sell what they're propping up buy what they're suppressing and wait them out because they cannot continue. This viewer says uh, that he is medically dependent and on a, has low income, and he's wanting to know what is the best way to survive the coming currency reset. Now, he says he already lives in a rural area, and he knows basic skills, and he's wanting to know should he be in like a lockdown area or should he get more supplies? What are some ways he can prepare being medically dependent and on a low income? Oh, gosh. He doesn't have a whole lot of alternatives. He's already living in a rural... Did, did you say he's living in a rural area? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good because it's the major metro centers that are most at risk. <sighs> he doesn't have a lot of alternatives. Um, you, you know, build an air raid shelter, you know, a, a deeper cellar. Uh, loaded up with with food, uh, you know, canned goods, dried meat, water. There's not a lot you can do. Storm centers and wait them out. I do not think they're going to win this battle. What they're going to force people to do is to join them out of fear. And what we need to do is to get courage, and and basically thumb our noses at them, so that we say, no, we got our goal. We got our silver, we got our water, we got our food, and we're going to win this because their derivative structure is going to break, and it's already breaking. And uh, it, it's getting to be crunch time, you know? It really is. We're going to win this, but we must wait them out. 
the ones who are in the most trouble are the ones who have no income and don't have a lot of their gold coins left and they're having to spend them. They're in trouble. And I have a, you know, a close contact who's in that category. And his only alternative is to get a job so he doesn't have to touch his remaining gold coins. This is very difficult. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say stay in your rural area, build yourself a little storage shelter underground, um, and, and don't tell all your neighbors about it. Because if you tell 10 of them, you're going to have a lot of company in that shelter, and you're going to run out of food real fast and water real fast. All right. Well, Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on goldenjackass.com. They can find you online at goldenjackass.com. Are there any last thoughts you'd like to add? And do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your newsletter if people are interested? Oh, the last comments. I think the last comments really have to be directed toward the European Union. We're in some very dicey times right now. There's an election that's about to take place in France. Uh, they just had an election in, in Netherlands. I'm trying to understand what happened in the Netherlands, but I think France is a good deal more important. Um, in France, they have falsified national polls, just like the United States did. The United States really is the mold. It, it, they set the standard for corruption in the voting process. Um, I believe Trump had a 30% lead going into the final weeks, and it was reported as a plus or minus 2 per 3% lead. It was a 30% lead, and somewhere between 7 and 10 million dead people voted for Hillary. That's all coming out, and if you want a good study on that, check the Stanford University Political Science reviews and some of their research work. Very high standards for both their study of the Hillary theft uh, against Bernie Sanders for the California primary and regional election theft of Hillary for the presidential race. But watch Europe <clears throat> because France and Italy are the focal points. Italy is very close for saying, F you, we're going back to the lira. And I'm going to admit something here, Elijah. It's not exactly embarrassing because it's, it's very complicated and difficult. But I had been saying for quite some time that Italy needed to get off the euro and let the rest of Europe dangle and twist on the euro currency rope. Um, it's a little more complicated than that because the euro has a balancing of several currencies and all redemption is done with weighted percentages so that if any one country gets off the euro currency, it breaks the entire weighting system and in other countries cannot get their payments because Italy broke it. In other words, if any one country breaks the euro, common euro currency system, it's called the European Monetary Union, not the union, not the union itself, that's political union. The European Monetary Union is the euro currency group. If any one country breaks that, the entire euro breaks. So that's why you haven't seen Italy get rid of the euro yet and go back to the lira currency, because they're being threatened. They're being threatened with murder and, and, golly, who knows what else. Maybe viral attacks, maybe assassination uh, skein chain. Um, but I think you're going to see the euro currency die first before the dollar. <clears throat> that could be the big melt-up for the dollar. The melt-up that kills the dollar could happen from the euro dissolving as a currency. <clears throat> so I, I'd watch what's going on there because uh, not only is their currency in deep, deep trouble, uh, there's a greater trend now toward ignoring the European Union commissioners. Uh, there was a hostile statement 
uh, made from, uh, I think, a Polish political figure, essentially calling Jean-Claude Juncker, the lead commissioner in the EU, calling him an alcoholic, a drunk, and out of control in formal meetings and gatherings. So the dissension is really rising in Europe. This is getting very, very strange and very, very ugly. <clears throat> the EU Commission also extended the Russian sanctions, even though every single nation that I know of demanded an end to the sanctions. So now you're seeing more defiance by member nations with respect to the sanctions, and they're doing deals with Russia. Germany just thumbed their nose at the EU Commission by making firm the contract for Nord Stream 2, which is a pipeline with Gazprom, and I think it involves LNG facilities in, in the northern coastline of Germany. You know, very few people in the United States understand that Germany is not landlocked. They've got, they've got the Bering Sea up north. It's a quick access to the Arctic. Uh, that's the German North. So that's how the Germans are linking with the Russians. In the North, where the U.S. really doesn't pay much attention. Russia is owning the Arctic right now. Uh, so pay attention to what's going on in France. And, you know, I, I recently had a, an exchange with a Hetrick Letter client in France. And uh, the person said... Marie Le Pen only has something like a 3% or 5% lead. And I said, oh, really? Here's a picture of Macron and his gathering. Here's a picture of Le Pen and her gathering. I would tend to think, given the empty seats for Macron and given the complete packed stadium for Le Pen, I would be willing to guess that your polls are like the United States polls and they're 30% off. So I think Le Pen has a large lead that's not properly reported, might not be 30 percent, could be 15, 18, 20 percent. But in the election, I expect Le Pen to do a lot better than the polls indicate. This is all toward the fracture of the EU, all toward the fracture of the globalists who are trying to set up the fascist state connecting the U.S. and Canada. This is all working toward the fracture of the euro currency, which will cause a dollar melt up which will bring about its death because the U.S. industries cannot tolerate a bigger leap upward in the dollar currency valuations. This is deadly for the U.S. economy. All right, those are my final comments, it's mostly centered in Europe. Uh, there were no questions by your listeners and, and followers about Europe, so I thought I'd add that in to, to complete the interview a bit. But uh, the website... Elijah, www.goldenjackass.com. Um, this month is the 13th anniversary. Started in April of 04. This has been quite the journey. This has been the exodus away from the dollar into the golden desert. And the desert's going to have rather significant oasis after oasis of beautiful clean water. On the website, goldenjackass.com there's lots of free material on the main 5.html the main website web page the public domain web page lots and lots of interviews I mean years back I did pretty much you know this is I'm dating I'm, I'm really getting nostalgic here but five or six years ago I used to write a public article almost every week uh, I, I probably did 40 to 45 per year now I do one a month and sometimes two. Le recently I've done two and I'm, I got another one planned uh, uh, this week possibly, another public article. But uh, goldenjackass.com has the free public articles and has the linked interviews like this. I try not to do a second interview or a third interview with the host who doesn't provide a public domain link for the followers and clients to, you know, hear the interview. Because, you know, I think they're valuable. I mean, I'm not patting myself, but I, I think these are important sources of information that are hard to obtain. On the same Golden Jackass website is the home of the Hattrick Letter. 
this month, as I said, the 13th anniversary. Uh, it's been a labor of love. I get exhausted at times, but I recharge my jets. I have friends who help me. We go have fun. I go for my bike rides. <laughs> I try to stay off the main roads. I do a lot of bike riding, Elijah, and I, it's amazing. About half my path is sidewalks and parks <clears throat> and, and back roads, you know, parallel road. Don't take that big boulevard. Take a parallel back road that has very little traffic. I try to stay safe, try to, you know, not have accidents. I actually had a bike accident, um, low-speed bike accident where I hit a post um, to avoid a little gully and making a turn, a truck coming in the direction. I, I avoided a gully by slamming on my bike brakes, and I, I lost my balance, and I, I hit a pole. It wasn't a slam into a pole. It was more like a, you know, a three-mile-an-hour, two-mile-an-hour impact that gave me a rib injury, and it took five weeks for the rib injury to go away. I guess I'm not as young as I used to be, but also, you know, I have 180 pounds, even even at three miles an hour, two miles an hour, 180 pounds hitting an immovable object like a post, it doesn't move. So I absorbed all my weight on the rib cage, but I'm okay now. I just barely feel it. Um, I hope people go to the website, bounce around the free area, sign up for the newsletter. For those people who are already aware of the newsletter, just go in there and catch some of the other interviews that you might have missed, because I am rather complete with the listing of the interviews and public articles. And I'm complete about giving you forewarning about interviews that are scheduled. I've got a couple scheduled for next week and they're, they're on the little coming attractions on the webpage. So ah, thanks for having me on, Elijah. It, it's, it's been fun. Um, it's always interesting. And, uh, you know, I hope to be on your show again sometime. and. I really hope people heed the advice of getting rid of your paper assets. It's not just stocks and bonds, people. It's your bank CDs. If they're too big, you're vulnerable for a, uh, a confiscation, a bail-in, whatever you want to call it. But these banks are, are in big, big trouble. Many of them are insolvent. And the tricks being done now on an international level by the banks are atrocious. They're stealing people's money, inviting them to sue in court because it's very difficult to win against a bank. And you must remember the 2005 Bush Bankruptcy Act. Your bank account, even if it's $180,000 or $12,000, your bank account, your savings account with the U.S. bank is not your asset. It is the bank's credit, unsecured credit. Check the law. Ask your accountant. Ask your attorney. And if they tell you that it's your asset, you better get a different attorney because you got a bad one. Bank accounts are unsecured assets owned by the bank. Unsecure credit as a bank asset, which begs the question, what is a secured asset for the bank? Their derivatives. So if they have a derivative failure, they can legally confiscate your entire account because you are unsecured credit. Check your legal status because that is exactly true. And it's not known widely across the United States. My brother laughs at me when I tell him that. He said, Jim, that's crazy. I said, I said, John, you're a Phi Beta Kappa political science and economics bachelor's degree holder and a law review student with a law 